Thanks, everyone. I'm excited to have the opportunity to give this talk via Zoom. Thank you for agreeing to still do it. Uh, let's just jump right in with the goal of error correction, classical or quantum. And the goal is to preserve messages sent through a noisy transmission channel by encoding the messages in an, what's called an error correcting code, which I'll define later. If we want to be more precise, the goal is to make sure that the rate of corruption of encoded or some, as it is sometimes known, logical information is lower than the rate of the same information sent without the extra encoding step. So graphically, you have some message row, which again can be classical or quantum. This is general. And it before being sent to the channel, it's encoded using some map called an encoder, which and then it's sent through the noise channel. And here I want to emphasize the noise channel can be uh, stationary in space and just uh, mimicking or modeling storage of information in time or it can literally be a physical wire like an optical fiber or like a, a free space uh, chunk of air uh, modeling communication through space. Uh, the formalism here designed by Shannon is sufficiently general to handle both cases. And after it's sent through the noise channel, it's, uh, it, it winds up on the receiving end and the receiver applies a map, another map called a decoder, uh, which then uh, is applied in hopes of obtaining the original message row. And so in terms of equations, you want the following to be satisfied. You want basically to, for the decoder to eat the noise. Okay. And I mean, uh, the approximate sign here is uh, not a coincidence. It's uh, not an accident. Uh, uh, it's to demonstrate that in the real world, we're never going to get it right. So everything is going to be approximate and there's going to be epsilons involved in real physical channels. However, this is the goal of error correction. We want this to be, you know, pretty much the case. So this uh, paradigm uh, is instrumental in several, you know, myriad technologies that you use today, including uh, hard drives, flash memory, wireless, 5G, multicast or broadcast, satellite communications, and what you're all here for, of course, uh, uh, the quantum version of this is useful for uh, describing quantum memories and quantum communication, communicating quantum information through space. I want to also, in this context, mention fault tolerance, which is something I won't have time to discuss too much, but it's something that dovetails nicely in this paradigm. And fault tolerance now is about injecting uh, operations, G, or gates, uh, and doing them on the message in this noisy environment. And the goal of fault tolerance is to make sure that the gates, G, don't amplify the noise in such a way that the decoder can't handle it anymore. So mathematically, this is actually a pretty simple little one-liner. If we say we want to perform a mess, uh, uh, an operation G on our encoded information, then if we permute G through the noise, obtaining another noise map n tilde, which is just and per con conjugated by G, then we want D to be able to eat n tilde as well. In other words, we want the gate not to amplify the noise from correctable to non-correctable. We want the noise to remain correctable. And this uh, fault tolerance, uh, designing fault tolerance schemes is more complicated than just error correction because it requires bare error correction as one of the ingredients. Uh, fault tolerance is a complicated interplay of, of uh, uh, noise, codes, encoders, decoders, and gates. Uh, and it's a very important topic that unfortunately I won't be able to do due diligence to today. So quantum error correction is the quantum version of what I just mentioned, and it was a somewhat interesting and surprising discovery. I think the main players initially were, of course, Peter Shore, who was the first to discover a quantum error correcting code, Shore's nine qubit code, as well as other uh, fault tolerant protocols uh, involved in rounds of error correction that we'll discuss. Uh, Alexei Kataev soon heard of Shor's discoveries and came along and discovered topological codes, as well as uh, after discussing with Preskill as early as 1999, uh, magic state distillation, along with a whole lots of other connections to chain complex, homology theory, topological phases, uh, et cetera. I think you, you are familiar with these people. There's of course other pioneers, for example, the inventors of stabilizer codes, 
uh, the inventors of three different fault tolerant error correction protocols. Uh, Neil Laflamme invented the QEC conditions, which we'll discuss today. And uh, the first threshold theorem was by Haronov and Ben Orr. Now, if I if I am to imitate uh, John Preskill here and 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 do the obligatory chart of uh, paper with with quantum error correction in the title. Uh, from the time the data seemed to be reliable on Google Scholar, uh, we've seen uh, more than a tenfold increase in such papers. So this is a topic that's been steadily increasing, uh, especially in light of recent experiments. So at this part, I want to encourage questions because this I'm going to try to take it a little bit slow, and uh, I want to get some points across. So let's look at the basics of error correction, <clears throat> and we're going to use the repetition code to do that. Now, what is a code, first of all? Well, a code is just jargon for a subspace of a quantum system that is picked or designed in such a way that it allows protection against some noise channel of interest. For example, consider the repetition code, which is designed to protect against bit flip noise, which is, again, jargon for sigma x or x acting on at most one qubit. Uh, the code that does this is a subspace, as we said, and any subspace needs a basis to be defined. So we pick this basis. The code is embedded in a space of three what are called physical qubits, and this basis is a set of two states, thereby it's encoding a logical qubit. The first basis state or code word is a state where all three physical qubits are in zero, and the second state is when all three qubits are in one. When we say we're encoding quantum information or preserving quantum information, we mean that we would like to preserve a general superposition of the two code words, aka a logical state, which I've written here. The C0, C1 coefficients are things we don't want to touch. We don't want our noise to touch them. We want to preserve them. Now let's look at what happens when we have an error or a bit flip acting on these, these superpositions. Let's say we want to flip the second qubit with uh, operator I'll denote by IXI, where order here determines which qubits we're acting on. And when we do this calculation in our head, we notice that flipping the second qubit has actually done two things. First, it has preserved the quantum superposition. And second, it has mapped it to a different corner of the Hilbert space, uh, namely to a subspace spanned by two states that are orthogonal to the original code words. These are called error words. And here we can apply basic quantum mechanics to uh, conclude that since the two spaces can be distinguished without collapsing the logical information within the respective spaces, bit flips can be detected. And this is true for any error that takes information out of the code space. In other words, basic quantum mechanics tells us there's a good set of quantum numbers that resolve states. Now, we don't want it to be too good so that we resolve the C0, C1 coefficients. We want it to be just good enough so that it resolves uh, the two spaces. For example, an observable can be that does so can be plus 1 on the state 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, and minus 1 on the state 0, 1, 0, and 1, 0, 1. It's coarse-grained enough to resolve the spaces, thereby detecting the error. So we're done. This is basically a very simple and intuitive a uh, piece of information that uses basic quantum mechanics to tell you that if an error takes you out of the code space, it's detectable. Okay? Um, I, and again, if anybody's got any questions, uh, feel free. So, um, right, so so we we can detect errors, but now we want to correct errors, right? We don't just want to detect. And to correct errors, uh, we need to perform what's called a round, or sometimes cycle, of quantum error correction. And this cycle consists of extracting just enough information, uh, namely information about these observables that uh, distinguish error spaces, without collapsing information within the error space or the code spaces, error spaces or the code space. So, so in terms of jargon, we want to first perform error diagnosis, which corresponds to measuring eigenvalues of these observables that I mentioned. These observables are called check operators. We'll see for the purposes of the repetition code, these are just ZZI and IZZ, where Z is the Pauli matrix sigma Z. And then we want to uh, decode or apply our recovery 
conditional on which airspace we found ourselves in. The airspaces are determined by eigenvalues, which are called error syndromes. And this together forms one round of error correction. So graphically, we have our three physical rails of the repetition code. We have our logical state encoded in that. First, we diagnose. So we attach some ancillas and extract enough information about the syndromes through these C0 gates. The first uh, ancilla, the blue one, the top one, acts on the C0 gates act on the first and second qubit. And they flip the state of the ancilla from plus or minus one. And if uh, the two uh, first two qubits are either in zero, zero, or one, one, then the ancilla modulo two is not flipped. And so the ancilla remains in the plus one state. And if the two first two qubits are in different states, then the ancilla will be flipped modulo two one time. And so the uh, qubit, ancilla qubit will be flipped and the outcome of the measurement will be minus one. The same thing happens for the bottom green part, the bottom green ancilla that acts on the second and third qubit. And so once we're armed with that information, now we decode, which is defined to be uh, the uh, task of determining which recovery to apply uh, given a syndrome outcome. Now, in the case of the second qubit flipping, we just apply IXI once more because of the properties of the Pauli matrices and when we go back into the code space. So because we have only four different possible outcomes of the two different binary syndromes, we can make a table called a lookup table where we list the syndrome outcomes and then the, 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 the decoding operation, which in this case also happens to be just the error. Now we assume that single bit flips are likely, so uh, the, the error that, we, that corresponds to each of the syndromes in our decoding scheme is just the single bit flip. And just to review here, if the first syndrome outcome, uh, first syndrome is plus one, that means the first and second qubit are in the same state, and the second one is minus one, means the second and third qubit are in different states. That actually implies that the third qubit was flipped. So the second line of the table, the error is IIX. This type of correction round, even seemingly simple here for the repetition code, generalizes straightforwardly to other error correcting codes. And we're not going to touch upon this, uh, these techniques uh, throughout the talk, just, but just uh, make, ho hoping you would remember that uh, this type of technique is what one has to do when one does uh, error correction. These rounds have to be applied sufficiently quickly so that the noise doesn't spiral out of control. So the repetition code, however, is not something we can, ha we can handle in the quantum world, or is not something that's useful, because it fails against another error that's new in the quantum world that's not present in the classical world. Namely, because we're storing superpositions, uh, we have to worry about the relative phase of the two of the logical state. And a single, what's called a phase flip, or phase error, Z here on the first qubit, will induce a minus sign within the code space. So it won't take you out of the code space, so it's not detectable, and it acts non-trivially, inducing this minus sign and thereby corrupting our state. So we have to get more creative. So let's consider this other very simple code. And this code, we will show detects both bit and phase errors. Now here, what's new is that each code word is itself a quantum superposition of the computational uh, binary labeled basis states. And this will be important against the phase errors. But before the phase errors, just to re recap with the bit flips, these are de still detectable for similar reasons as for the repetition code, namely due to the spacing between the computational basis states, aka the number of ones, participating in superpositions of each code word. There's a difference by two of the number of ones participating in this logical zero versus logical one. Let's look at what happens when the first qubit is flipped. So if we do this, um, we notice that we go to a different space orthogonal to the code space an error space. Let's label that by 0x and 1x. We want to uh, detect all single qubit bit flips, so let's see what happens when the second qubit is flipped. Well, when we do that carefully, we see that we go to the same error space. Uh, okay, well, each error still took you out of the code space, so by the take-home message of basic quantum mechanics, they're detectable, right? I should see some nods, right? Now, uh, what about correctable? So both errors have taken us to the same code space. Uh-oh, what's that called? That's called degeneracy. That's new in quantum too. In classical, it doesn't exist. We have to deal with it. Uh, 
Now, does this mean that they can't be correctable? Well, they can in general, but in this case, if you notice, they are not correctable because they have induced a different operation on the code words. You see here the way we labeled things by 0x and 1x, the second qubit has mapped 0L to, to 1x and 1L to 0x. And so the two errors are not the same. Flipping the first qubit is equivalent to first undergoing a logical bit flip and then flipping the second qubit. So say we want to recover by first diagnosing that we're in this error space. We want to recover against both errors. We can't do that because if we say recover with the identity operation, that'll co correct the first qubit bit flip but it'll yield a logical, residual logical error if, if the second qubit bit flip occurred. Vice versa, if we try the logical, x logical is the recovery operation. So, and we can't know which one occurred because they both map you to the same error space. So there's no way to distinguish them. And so this degeneracy yields an extra complication we have to handle, which in this case means two errors are not correctable. Let's go to phase flips now. Now I mentioned each code word is itself a superposition. Well, let's look at what happens when we apply a phase flip. Well, phase flips will not change the binary labels of the computational basis states, but will induce relative phases within each code word superposition, right? So here you see some minuses pop up. And if you remember, a minus superposition is orthogonal to the plus superposition of the code space. So this is indeed another valid error space. We're going to label it by 0z and 1z. And the same thing happens here when we flip the second qubit or the first, because of the symmetry of the code. You see the ones and zeros are paired up. Okay, but we wanna protect against all single qubit phase flips. So let's see what happens if we flip the third or equivalently the fourth. This induces another set of minuses, but now if you carefully look at it, we have once again mapped to the same error space and induced a different operation. So once again, all four phase flips take you out of the code space. Are we detectable? Yes. However, the second and first qubit phase flips map to the same error space, but induce a different effect than the third and fourth qubit phase flips, which means that these errors are not simultaneously correctable because the recovery is only able to correct one of the errors, two of the four errors, sorry. And similar behavior, which I won't describe, occurs for joint bit phase flips uh, denoted by sigma y. So in general here, this code detects all single qubit Pauli errors but does not correct them for the reasons I've shown above. Uh, let me know if there's any questions. Now, Actually, there I, are other... I have yes. a question about something sure. you said. So you made a comment about earlier that when you do the error correction, you have to do it sort of quickly enough that you don't get extra errors while you are doing the decoding. Can you comment a bit more on that? Like how, how is that dealt with? Right. So between rounds of error correction, noise will occur. And if noise, if, if uncorrectable errors occur, uh, then a round of error correction will uh, not help. So, and, and we assume that uncorrectable errors are less likely than correctable, and we design codes to, to, to handle such noise channels. And so these types of rounds of error correction have to be applied stroboscopically, you know, quickly enough so that the, the chances of uncorrectable errors are less likely than um, are less likely to occur. Thanks. So we've we've shown that this code detects single qubit pallies, but general errors are not single qubit pallies. They can be rotations, coherent errors, etc. However, in a very favorable series of events here, it turns out that correcting single qubit, detecting, sorry, single qubit pallies is, uh, per, implies that you can detect single qubit errors. And this is due to the following two facts. The first is the check operator measurement collapses the system uh, onto one of the error spaces or the code space in the case of no error. The second fact is that the pallies form a basis for single qubit operators. And these two facts imply that, in fact, general errors are detectable. So let's look at why this is the case with an example for the four qubit code. So recall this error space structure that I've drawn here uh, in the form of this sort of matrix 
in the air spaces or cubes in the, or sorry squares in this matrix you have the logical space in the upper left and you have the, some of the air spaces we discussed in the previous slides following it and let's look at a, uh, a more general error in the form of a z-axis rotation. Now, this holds generally, but I'm going to do it for this specific case. Now, this z-axis rotation can be expressed as a superposition of the Pauli matrix Z and the identity matrix. And when this rotation acts on, say, the first qubit, you get the following state. This state is a quantum superposition of the logical information in the code space and the logical information in the Z error space. Now, when we do a measurement, a la one round of error correction, we will collapse onto one of the blue squares that is uh, outlined in red, thereby killing off coherences that we don't want between the error spaces. This type of measurement will still preserve the logical information because, as I said, the error syndromes or the check operators are coarse enough not to kill off the, the data that we're trying to store. And so in this favorable application of the collapse principle, we actually are able to correct general single, sorry, detect <laughs> general single qubit errors uh, because the process of measuring or diagnosing uh, collapses us onto a Pauli error, which we know how to detect. And this is a very general principle that's very important. Now let's look at uh, the effects we've seen more generally uh, in the form of these QEC conditions. Now we've seen that errors, now in general, sorry, errors EJ, which you can imagine to be, say, bit flips for the uh, four-qubit code, are detectable if and only if they act trivially on the code words. So equivalently, that can be stated in terms of an environment, which you can think of the, as the noise channel being as, as coming from an environment. Let's say the environment has the ability to measure expectation values of EJ uh, in the code words. Well, in order to not know the coefficients, the environment better not be able to distinguish the code words. Otherwise, it'll be able to know something about the logical information. Equivalently, the environment better not be able to connect distinct code words or make um, bit flips <coughs> between the logical states. These two conditions can be concisely stated in terms of this error detection condition using the projection on the code space, which is the outer product of the logical states. And this holds for more general codes, not just qubit encodings. Um, so the coefficient here, Cj, need not be zero. So if your error takes you out of the code space, the coefficient is zero and you're detectable, right? This is a sufficient condition, but it's not necessary. For example, there, is, there, are type, there are different operators that don't take you out of the code space, that maintain you within the code space, but don't do anything in the code space. For example, for the four qubit code, the ZZII operator leaves the code states alone and spits out a plus one eigenvalue. Okay, we're, we're gonna study that guy a little more later on, but this guy is also a detectable error because it doesn't do anything. In some sense, it doesn't need to be detected. In another way, philosophically, you're detecting it using the identity syndrome measurement. Now, for correctability, which we have yet to talk about, let's consider two errors, EJ and EK. And if, now here is, the generacy here becomes important. If these errors map into different error spaces, then if the errors are detectable, then they're also correctable. However, as we've run into this issue, in the case of degeneracy, if they map into the same error space, then they are correctable only if they, are, uh, they impose the same effect on the logical information. Another way of saying that is if the two errors are able to undo each other. Now, this can be stated concisely in using the projection in terms of, as the nil of flam error correction conditions. And again, CJK doesn't have to be zero. For the case of the four qubit code, we saw that single qubit bit flips are not correctable because they cannot undo each other, because they induce a, they, they, they're equivalent up to a logical uh, uh, bit flip. And so if we pair them up and, and plug them into these conditions, we see there's a residual logical bit flip, which means that they induce a non, their combination induces a non-trivial effect on the code space. In other words, they don't undo each other. Okay, so now we're gonna, you'll be surprised maybe how much mileage we can get out of this four qubit code. First, let's take the basis for the four qubit code and rewrite it in the form of another basis, the plus minus basis. 
and then concisely phrase this basis in the following way, where we have these GHZ states, or namely GHZ states with two uh, qubits, copied over twice. Okay, so now we're seeing some knobs. But first, how do we construct this code? Well, this code can be viewed as a concatenated code. First, we do a basic repetition code. Now, it's a stupid repetition code because majority voting doesn't work. We're only encoding in two physical bits. But bear with me here, because then we can superimpose this basis into the phase basis and do another repetition code with that basis. And that yields our uh, original four qubit code, which clearly has some power to it. But now we want to correct errors. Well, we can just tune our knobs to be higher by one. Our M1 and M2 is now three. That yields the shore nine qubit code, which has enough error spaces to resolve single qubit errors in a way that each of them acts distinctly uh, on the on the um, on the logical information in such a way that they can be correctable, and this was the first uh, error correcting code: a concatenation of a simple three qubit repetition, bit flip repetition, and phase flip repetition. For general M1, M2, there's of course this family of generalized short codes, also known as quantum parity codes, that you you're welcome to check out in the zoo. Let's stick with the four qubit code now and do something else to it. These are the logical states. Recall our uh, magical operator that has, uh, for which, which admits the code words as plus one eigenvalue eigen subspace. Turns out there's several operators that do that, namely two more, IIZZ and XXXX. Uh, these also happen to commute. And these form the code's stabilizer group. These generate the code stabilizer group. In other words, any group element of this group can be expressed as a uh, product of powers of these three generating elements. Now, this four qubit code is an example of a stabilizer code. And stabilizer codes come with some notation, uh, NKD notation. N is the number of physical qubits, K is the number of logical qubits, and D is the distance. And uh, D minus one is the highest weight Pauli error that the code can detect. So for the case of the four qubit code, it's a 412 code. It's encoding one logical qubit into four physical qubits, and it can detect a single qubit Pauli error, which means the weight is one, and one plus one is two. Stabilizer codes yield several advantages. They're, the, they're sort of the analog, by the way, of linear codes from classical coding theory. First, they yield an efficient representation. The code space no longer needs to be written out of some complicated superposition of computational basis states. You just need to know the generators, the stabilizer generators, whose mutual plus one eigenspace is the code. Syndromes are obtained for free. If you look at it closely, the group generators are the check operators we need to measure in our round of error correction. So for the repetition code, it's ZZI and IZZ is the stabilizer generator set. And this is a very general idea that has been applied to many different uh, paradigms successfully. Okay, now let's look at our four qubit code again. Let's take those stabilizers and rewrite them or encode their information about them into matrices, binary matrices, where ones means there's an X or Z there respectively and zero means there's identity. So we have three stabilizer generators and we have these two matrices, HX and HZ. Stabilizer codes require these matrices commute. The commutation relation can be equivalently expressed as this condition on the matrices. HX times HC transpose evaluated with addition multiplication modulo two is zero. That's equivalent to the stabilizer generators commuting. So to design codes in this way, we just need a pair of matrices that satisfy a certain property. Well, there's well-known classical coding theory techniques that yield such pairs of matrices. This yields the CSS codes. Again, another very important code class. This also yields a very interesting connection to homology, namely chain complexes. I won't have time to go into it other than sketch them out. So chain complexes are sequences of things with connected by boundaries. Say this triangle, you apply boundary map to this triangle, it scoops out the interior, just gives you the outline. You apply the boundary map again, you get zero. Boundaries don't have boundaries, the fundamental rule of chain complexes. By analogy, consider the space, some kind of abstract space of X parity checks. And consider the boundary map as this matrix acting on this vector space of X checks. This maps you to the physical qubit space. 
consider applying an instantiation of the boundary map again, it maps you to the z-check space. And the condition that boundaries don't have boundaries is equivalent to the CSS condition. So this yields a very powerful dictionary to homology theory and was is in part one of the key ingredients in the recent QLDPC code uh, achievements. Now let's let's do like a look at our four qubit code again. Let's arrange the four qubits in a square and observe the geometrical pattern formed there's by the a state. question oh, from the audience. There's a question. Sorry. Yes. Um, in the previous slide, sorry, that's a bit uh, fast. Um, so what, what is the mapping to the chain complex? Could you say a bit more words about that? There's three vector spaces, uh, binary vector spaces. One is associated with the space of X parity checks. Um, one is associated with the physical qubits, and one is associated with the Z checks. And maps between, uh, vec oh, sorry, maps on vector spaces are matrices. And if you just define these um, boundary maps or these maps between these vector spaces to be the matrices uh, corresponding to the CSS code, then the maps satisfy a condition that allows you to define a chain complex from the CSS code. And and, uh, and just to confirm, this is only for CSS code. So um, is, is it one-to-one, -one? like all the CSS code can be mapped this way? And or, or no? Yes, uh, I think many-to-one, uh, but for each CSS code, there's at least one chain complex. And okay. for each chain complex that's length two, you can cook up a CSS code. It's pretty cool, and it'd be nice to generalize this to other ways. There's also other quantum, to cl classical to quantum mappings you can ask me about that people don't study as much and would be nice to study. All right, square. Our stabilizer generators are ZZII, IIZZ, XXXX. And if we, geomet if we, if we sort of depict them by these squares and, and, and semicircles, we see this kind of pattern. Well, we start to see a geometry form and then we can take off, right? We can take off and look at other geometries. This specific 412 code is actually an example of what's called a rotated surface code. And you can see this, these rotated surface codes for small instantiations are straightforward generalizations of these, this type of um, tic-tac geometry. And of course, these are all descendants of the original toric code, which is a slightly different, but in spirit, the same formulation on a, on a geometrically local lattice of qubits with periodic boundary conditions. Uh, of course, this, 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 this Torah code is a more general class of Kitai of surface codes that can be defined on geometries with open boundary conditions and on geometries that have holes in them that encode logical qubits. I don't have time to get into this now, but Ben Brown, I'm sure, will discuss it. And then people have, you know, there's been 20 years of work on considering other types of geometries for various reasons to increase distance, to increase rate. Um, more recently, I wanna point out some work on fractal geometries, poking holes in the 3D lattice, which is quite, quite interesting and original. Four cubic code again, last time. It's very simple. Take the ecological code words, add up the binary labels uh, within each computational basis states, merge the same labels together, you get this code. What is this? The binomial code. It's a subspace now of the Fox space of a single boson where the, the number in the ket labels the occupation number of the boson. And this is called a bosonic code. To introduce bosonic codes, I, I prefer a geometric perspective, which can be obtained readily from the repetition code. Let's arrange the three physical qubits of the repetition code on this Hamming cube. And the code words now we would depict by black and white balls respectively. 000, zero, zero and 111 are the black and white balls. Now, each code word has its own Voronoi cell, which is the cell of uh, corners of the cube that are closer in the cube geometry to the origin, to the ball than to the other ball. And any error that keeps each code word or each ball within its Voronoi cell is correctable. Okay? And this is the geometrical equivalent, equivalent geometrical picture of aircraft codes. Let's look at the bosonic version of this. So what is the most naive bosonic version we can do? Well, we have our bosonic momentum position Hilbert space. 
Now let's just put two coherent states, black and white balls, uh, antipodally on the x-axis with on a, that lie on a circle, imagine a circle of radius alpha, real alpha. And here the Voronoi cell is this semicircle uh, that I've drawn in blue here, corresponding to the black balls Voronoi cell. And this type of code protects against rotation errors. As long as the rotation error keeps, keeps each ball within its own semicircle, this error is correctable. This is a, a code that's basically an analog of a classical code. However, it's quite powerful because it lies within a single mode. It doesn't require the thermodynamic limit. It just requires the infinite alpha limit. And there's very deep connections to phases of classicalizing models, even in 2D potentially, uh, between this code. Okay. It also is a very practical code. Uh, and uh, uh, anyway, it's, it's a nice, cute analog of classical codes that doesn't require the thermodynamic limit. Now, we also want to protect against the set of errors dual to rotation errors, which are contraction errors, radial contraction errors. And if we just uh, superimpose more balls, we'll be able to do that, similarly with, as we did with the four qubit code. So far, these two codes deal with rotational errors. Now, we want to say deal with translational errors, which are uniform shifts in the phase space of the oscillator. Well, for that, we have GKP codes. We take a lattice, a sublattice of black balls and white balls and superimpose them in the phase space of the oscillator. And any shift error that keeps each ball within its own unit cell, which in this case is also the Voronoi cell, will be correctable. And these codes protect against simultaneous shifts in the position and the momentum. And they're named after Goddess Mkhitaryan and Presco. There's many different use cases of these bosonic codes. I had a question about this. Sure. So in general, what's the notion of distance you want to use? It seems like it's quite different in the first case and the bosonic cases. Correct. What's the general notion of distance when you define these Voronoi cells? Uh, geometry of the space the Voronoi cells are drawn in. Uh, more, that's the most general way I can think of. Uh, in the specific case of the translational errors, it's the, the maximum correctable displacement. So it's the norm of the displacement in the position of the momentum. Thanks. Right, so you start to see different notions of distance here, right? Uh, but the concept of a Voronoi cell is nice enough that it can be uh, applied to tensor product spaces, as in the case of the repetition code, or bosonic spaces, or other molecular uh, spaces that, that, that I had some work on early on. So all these infinite dimensional bosonic, et cetera, spaces have some use cases. Some of them are intrinsic to the fact that the bosonic Hilbert space is infinite dimensional, while any fixed finite qubit space is not. OK, I don't have time to go into that. I do want to point out one specific example, namely this kapusin fitkowski theorem that says you can't have chiral topological phase commuting projector models in finite dimensions. And I think it might be fruitful to look at oscillators and rotors and other infinite dimensional spaces to cook up simple models for chiral topological phases. There's been some work in this direction, but it's at this point is fairly involved. OK, so want to return before we go to some highlights of the research to the main purpose of error correction. The primary goal of error correction is to yield a probability of corruption of the encoded information, which we'll call p-logical, to be smaller than some reference probability of the unencoded information corruption. Let's denote that probability as p-physical. Now, in the quantum realm, a more ambitious goal has been laid and has been made possible by the notion of a threshold which is yet another error probability, below which it actually turns out to be possible to construct error correcting codes with arbitrarily large uh, protection, level of protection, at the price of, of uh, sufficiently large resources. So if we just define this gain to be the ratio of the physical to the logical error rate, we can phrase all these three different concepts in one way. We want P logical to be smaller, so we want the gain to be greater than, we want the gain to be large. A gain of unity is called break even QEC, and it doesn't really help us. As soon as the gain goes beyond unity, we start achieving the primary goal of error correction, and error correction namely starts to work. The threshold theorems allow us to obtain arbitrarily large gain as long as we're below this physical probability called the threshold probability. And this is very powerful because we want to have good gates 
And so we can set our gate to be whatever, and we just then spit out the number of resources we need. These threshold theorems require, however, infinite families of tensor product codes, as well as the thermodynamic limit. In other words, a small code or a finite set of codes is not going to cut it. So let's go over some highlights. One is about decoding. So let's go back to our repetition code lookup table that I've extended here a bit. In the repetition code, we use the principle of maximum likelihood decoding. We assumed that low weight pallies were more likely than high weight pallies, right? So for each syndrome, we had an error that we picked to be the recovery map because it would undo the error because of the properties of the pally matrices. However, if you look at column three, uh, there are other errors that could have occurred that would have led to the same error space, namely to the same syndrome diagnosis. Moreover, if you look at the fourth column, there were also some pairs of face flips that could have happened that wouldn't have changed absolutely, would have changed absolutely nothing because those are precisely the stabilizer operators that we're measuring. So there's a lot of different things that could have happened that taken us, that it could have taken us to the error spaces that we obtain by diagnosing the errors. And in general, the type of recovery, the general recovery for the stabilizer, stabilizer codes incorporates all of these pieces. It consists of a map that actually physically maps isometrically the error space back into the code space. Then it, it also applies some residual logical operation depending on which error we think happened. This is that XL that happened when we had the, the single qubit bit flips for the four qubit code. And then there's also some stabilizer group element that was just along for the ride, right? And, and that, that could have happened. We didn't really, that didn't really change anything. So in general, for general codes, for stabilizer codes, we want to solve the maximum likelihood decoding problem, which means finding the most likely error that happened given a syndrome. We already know which error space we're in. We want to know how we got there. And we do that by doing this maximization. This maximization is NP complete. So good luck. However, it can be made efficient for certain codes, such as the surface code, and uh, some we just put out a work actually on some bosonic codes. So the complexity of this is kind of all over the place, and it's a very interesting problem, and it's where the magic of decoding, designing good decoders comes in. You'll hear the word minimum weight perfect matching, I'm sure. That's a common decoder for the, for the surface code. Now, if we want to optimize in a way that sort of sums up or averages up over all the different stabilizer equivalent errors, we get the general maximum likelihood decoding. And this is even worse. And this was discovered, uh, this sharp P completeness of this problem was uh, uh, a paper by the late Dave Poulong and others um, in 2013. And there's a beautiful mapping that relates this sum to a partition function and then relates that partition function to that of classical model. Um, and uh, that has been proven fruitful in determining thresholds associated with topological codes. Moving on to experiments. Here's all the experiments that I'm aware of that happened with qubit stabilizer codes. Um, we can discuss this afterward. I just want to highlight the last two lines. These have been the largest codes to date. And uh, in particular, Kevin will tell us about the surface code. Uh, recall that we need to uh, to obtain a threshold, we want to see experimentally a scaling of the suppression of the error with the increase of resources. And so this is what Google, one of the goals of the Google experiments has been to try and see that. They increase the number of qubits from 9 to 25 and see if that, that actually gives you an increase in the game. And you'll hear about that from Kevin. So as bosonic experiments are concerned, initially there was experiments on multimode and photonics community. And now there's been a focus using trapped ions and microwave cavities uh, in a single mode that's been very long-lived mode inherently. But nevertheless, uh, here the focus is to go to break-even error correction and then go to beyond break-even, showing an improvement in the logical lifetime. And uh, there's been some uh, hints about that from the March meeting this year from the Devere group using GKP codes. So stay tuned for that. On the commercial side, there's been a several interesting commercial proposals combining bosonic and qubit codes uh, so that the advantages of both can be preserved. Uh, concatenating bosonic and qubit codes improves thresholds, and using bosonic codes for the inner layer of the concatenation is very nicely compatible with the physical platforms these people are working on. 
However, it's not yet clear which, which platform, which combination they're really going to try to go with. Let's look at the conferences. So there's this conference in quantum error correction. It was the next, the last one was held in 2017. And John here in his out, overview talk outlined or binned the talks into different subfields, right? And you can see there was a lot of talks about topological codes. There's some general fault tolerance and a lot of experiments. In 2019, I did the same, I'm doing the same thing here. And you can see now there's two changes I want to highlight. Uh, there's been this recent blow up already seen in 2019 in the QLDPC code literature. Okay, going from zero to nine talks. And bosonic coding has also kind of blown up uh, with five talks at QEC about that. Topological codes remain one of the top, one of the highlighted topics as well. So Topological codes, as I said, are a continuously studied topic. I can't do it justice here. I do want to sum up the key papers that you want to read if you're interested in, in, in catching up on that. And then here, just for record keeping, don't try to squint. I do want to highlight a few of its relatives, of its new relatives. Uh, one is these Clifford deformed surface codes, which is a general class that includes XY codes, XZZX codes, rotated surface codes. Uh, these are interesting in part because they, they help protect against bias noise, noise that's extremely skewed toward X or Z errors only. Um, and of course, in the other parents here, I'm mentioning connections to the CSS formalism, the topological phase formalism, and the chain complex stuff I tried to gloss over using this in this hypergraph product code. As I mentioned, it's the surface code has been looked at for fractal dimensions. And there's lots of other connections to the Majorana version of writing the surface code that allows for efficient numerics. IBM's heavy hexagon code is sort of inspired by it. This honeycomb code, this is a Floquet code that is a continuous sort of measurement code that also is inspired by a relative of the same phase, and these QLDPC codes. So QLDPC, what is that? Uh, we'll hear from Eugene about this in the next talk, but a QLDPC code is a stabilizer code for which the number of qubits participating in each stabilizer generator, or parity check, is independent of n, as well as the number of stabilizer generators participating in each qubit is also independent of n. So notice here, geometric locality is not required. So this is locality as the CS people like to talk about it, okay? each parity check has some fixed number of weights, and then each qubit has some fixed number of parity checks touching it, okay? But the geometry doesn't have to be there. And if you study this class of codes, there's been a recent uh, discovery of what's called asymptotically good families of QLDPC code. So this is a family, infinite family of codes, whose rate, k over n, and relative distance, d over n, remain constant in the thermodynamic limit, namely as i goes to infinity. There's three classes of codes that have been discovered so far. And as I said, Eugene will likely tell you more about them. As, as for me, I want to comment that geometric locality is not only not required for this, it actually has to be dropped. There are results on codes on lattices, normal, square, whatever, lattices in any dimension, cannot be good QLDPC codes. And moreover, don't even give you very good gates or admit a limited set of transversal gates, which are gates that can be expressed as tensor products acting on subsets of qubits that are of constant size. And there's a famous Bravi Koenig theorem there. So if we want to upgrade QLDPC to or link it to topological phases, we're going to have to drop geometric locality, which we, you know, which we know as physicists, know and love as physicists. Some other notable codes before I wrap up that I'm not going to be able to get into uh, is, of course, holographic codes. Uh, here, it's encoding circuit as a tensor network in a hyperbolic geometry, and that yields some connections to the ADS-CFT correspondence. QEC can be used for sensing if you want to apply a gate within a code space and treat the parameter of that gate as something that you want to measure, then your error correction can help you do that as long as the signal doesn't get washed out during your correction step. Subsystem codes are just codes, NKD codes, where some of the K logical qubits are not used for storage. They're called, they're defined to be gauge qubits and sort of molded 
their state inside can be changed to, to yield better, to yield more options for gates. Locate codes uh, introduce sort of the paradigm of time in the stabilizer formalism, and their logical qubits are generated through a particular sequence of check operator measurements. And this chain complex connection that I glossed over, thanks for the question, by the way, can be taken to the extreme. Hardcore math can be applied. Uh, and there has been this race up until this last year to build good QLDPC codes using results from homology theory and topology and et cetera, and applying them to CSS codes through this chain complex connection. And finally, there's been some interesting work on uh, codes useful for magic state distillation. Uh, which is a way to do gates that are not the some sort of simple, easy Clifford gates that we're all familiar with. And there's a list of codes in the air correction zoo that have to deal with that. So all of this is available on the zoo. Um, I don't have time to get into it now. Just want to wrap up with my two cents. I'm, uh, it's exciting to see that we are really beginning to scale up and we are not seeing too many surprises, which is good news. Uh, Google has done this experiment with repetition codes. They see that with increasing resources, they get an increase in performance, and the proper scaling for the for the decrease in the logical error rate should be exponential with the number of physical qubits, and they do see that. Uh, Kevin will tell you about some of the progress on the quantum side using the, the surface code I mentioned. One of the key questions that one should ask as this scaling up happens is, do we see any surprises in the structure of the noise? And uh, we don't, the noise remains local, which is you know, very good news because error correction should then continue to work. This was not an intuitive, you know, this, was, this could have gone the other way and that would have been very exciting in the some sense, but also kind of bad news because we'd have to sort of redo our whole paradigm. Uh, and this to me is beginning to be a daunting systems engineering challenge. It's not clear how much resources people have put into this, or the companies have put into this. But the good news, as I am told, is that once the main proof of principle experiment is done uh, and the information is shared, it's possible to replicate that experiment with much fewer resources, uh, which is the good news. And uh, if you remember some of Google's slides from their previous talk, they had a huge map of all the different bits and pieces of their, of their uh, protocol and you know, several of the dots had a thesis attached to them, basically. So it's 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 beginning to look like a collective type of effort is required to really scale up to these large scale platforms. Um, just a couple of uh, interesting, just food for thought. Um, I was uh, taken and 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 completely agree with uh, uh, Martinez's quote from yesterday. Uh, we do want to focus uh, if we want if we are to scale up on characterizing physical noise and materials. Uh, I think it will be nice and, and hope to see uh, the theory of thresholds connected to, you know, very robustly connected to experiment. We're starting to see that, right? And, and uh, it would be nice to see that not only for the memory, but also for the gates. Uh, again, we're starting to see that there is a paper I maybe should have mentioned here by, uh, I'm sorry, I, I'm forgetting the name, but, but it was a trapped ion, I think, paper with two steam codes. They have started to look at logical gates. Uh, beyond break-even. Um, this QLDPC uh, letting loose of geometric locality is to me as a physicist quite scary. And uh, it's also uh, practically not, not very, it, it, it imposes an extra hurdle. And so maybe we want to take a look at that. We want to maybe preserve some of the power of the QLDPC codes uh, while still connecting to the real world, which is indeed geometrically local. And something that continues to be useful and uh, continues to be done, uh, for example, by Shruti Puri uh, in this recent work with the Rydberg stuff, is to try and to really keep in mind the specific platform you're designing the error correcting code for. I mean, they do this in classical coding theory all the time. And I think it's nice for computer scientists to talk to physicists and, and really keep the specific experiment in mind. So with that, I want to wrap up and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Victor, for that very nice talk. It was a great overview. So we had a couple of questions during the talk. I think we have time for one or two more before the next one. Yeah, I see one. <laughs>
Hi, uh, you mentioned a kind of no-go theorem for these QLDPC codes being local. Do you have a simple physical intuition for why such a theorem is true? Or? I should, shouldn't I? <laughs> and I think I, I did at some point when I heard An Anirudh Krishna's talk. Um, but I don't know if I'm going to be able to do it justice at this specific moment. Okay, thanks. Uh, hey, Victor, thanks for the nice talk. Just, I want to ask a similar question to the last one in the same vein. Um, when you say locality has to be dropped, you, you're talking about like locality on a Euclidean sort of flat lattice. Correct. In these statements, is that correct? Like, correct, yeah. So, um, uh, do you know what might be achievable if we kind of accept going to negatively curved spaces in fixed sort of dimensions? I mean, I can only tell you sort of what the, the, the results are, right? So, so first there was this old school BPT bound application by Friedman and company. And the distance here can only sort of scale this way with the dimension. Again, this is Euclidean capital D dimensional lattices. Um, I think this is honor roots bound. So here you might want to just take a look at that, you know, after we get done here. Uh, I'm not sure what he says about negatively curved spaces. Again, I think this 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 sentence I know also has to deal with again a capital D. Um, and but this starts to get into how many edges uh, you need. You basically need some some, some amount of connectivity. Uh, uh, so these QLDPC codes were done with expander graphs, which have they should basically defined to be as graphs that are pretty well connected. And a Euclidean lattice just doesn't cut it. It's not connected enough. And these bounds are, are, are basically starting to imply that at least for the Euclidean case, that's, that's, they confirm that that's not enough. Okay. Maybe somebody has something smarter to say at this. I'm sorry, I'm not doing the best job here. No, that's useful, thanks. But so maybe you can summarize by saying that the, the, uh, restriction is kind of coming from the scaling of the connectivity of Euclidean graphs rather than the fixed dimension. And we should look at things where we get much more connectivity, maybe hyperbolic spaces are enough. Uh, yeah, I would say that the connectivity improves not only marginally with dimension, so it still remains a problem, I think so. Although, you know, 4D Torah code is a self-correcting memory. Um, 4D hyperbolic surface codes ha were shown to have pretty good rates, but again, not enough, right? The QLDPC stuff really requires this expander thing, which is like the next step in connectivity. Okay, thanks. All right, I don't see any more immediate. Okay, one, one last question, then we should move on to the next talk. Yeah, just a quick question, somewhat related to the previous ones. Is there a connection between uh, locality and the threshold? So the threshold, the, there's a topological threshold theorem that one obtains from uh, this surface code statmec mapping. And that is definitely related to locality. Now there's concatenated threshold theorem that is less, seems a bit more obscure in terms of the connection to locality. Uh, and then there are these QLDPC codes that we keep talking about that have you know, a lot of connectivity that as far as I know, um, are still yet to be investigated in terms of thresholds. And so for that, for those codes, it's not yet clear. Thanks. So the paper you wanna read here that starts this this whole statmec thing off with the, and the threshold as well as this one. All right, let's let's thank Victor again. Thank you. And we'll move on to the next talk, which will take us deeper.